architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker on issues of architecture and architectural thinking. Today visiting me from down under from Adelaide is Amit Srivastav who recently co-authored a fantastic book on the history of the architecture of India with my very good friend Peter Scriber. The history of Indian architecture that starts around 1947 with India's independence is a classic paradigmatic story of post-colonial architecture with its roots in the colonial period and with its foundational aspiration to become a great modernist event following independence and then its critiques and revisions in the era of postmodernism and globalization. Uh, this is the story that we will rehearse today with Amit Srivastav and try and get into some of its lesser known micro histories. Here we go. Hi, Amit. Welcome to Architecture Talk. Thank you, Vikram. Thank you for having me here. So, Amit, uh, you with my very good friend, very good old friend, Peter Scriber. Mm-hmm. at Adelaide, published this fantastic book called, well, it's part of the Modern Architectures in History series, which was published by Reaction, which, by Reaction Books, and they have a number of other histories which still keep coming out. And you guys did the India history yep. and published it in 2015, a fantastic, beautiful book, very well laid out, 370-odd pages. Yes. Uh, I think it's one of the thicker volumes in that series. It's one of the thicker volumes and deservedly and properly so because (laughs) it is a a beautifully written, very complicated and nuanced history of this period. So so congratulations for this book. Thank you. Uh, And you have, you know, seven chapters in this book. You know, you start around 1855 and as I can see... By your seventh chapter, you are even talking about since 1990s, so since neoliberalism, if you like. Yeah. So you are covering this kind of 150-year period. Yes. And there's the colonial period, and then there's the sort of the late colonial, what you call complexity and contradiction. Yeah. Then you talk about the nation-building period, which is, let's say, you know, after independence in 47, under the Nehruvian period. Yes. And uh, then the history becomes more complicated. Yeah. And I see chapters which sort of double back and forth in time. Yes. There is regionalism, institution building, and the modern Indian elite, 1950s to 1970s. And then two chapters, one called Development and Dissent, the critical turn, Yes. 1960 to 1980s. Yeah. And then identity and difference, the cultural turn. Yes. 1980s to 1990s. First, there's a critical turn, then there is a cultural turn. Before, in the last chapter, we've arrived at the non modern. Yes. Towards the non modern. Yes. Fascinating use of terms. <laughs> Architecture and global India since 1990. So that's the outline of the book as far as chapter headings is concerned. So tell me, at this very high level, yes. what is the... I mean, we know the big story of Indian history. Yeah. Colonial, late colonial, modernism, you know, festivals you know, uh, Indianization, regionalization, and so on. Yeah. So how is your story recast or re... How do you see this history of architecture in India, modern architecture in India, 
What is your, your sort of particular take on it? Mm. I think yeah, it's, it's a good question to try and capture what the book is trying to do. What and is I, trajectory, yes. Yeah, and I think, I think you've said the right <coughs> thing where you say we all know the big story. Mm. And in a way, the big story is part of many other big stories about different parts of the world that have already been written. Yeah, yeah. So when you trace whether um, historically or stylistically, you kind of go, you know, this sort of colonial, late colonial, um, and then this sort of mm. modernist period followed by a kind of postmodernist sort of dabbling in regional concerns. Mm -hmm. um, this is a story that is not just about India, it's about everywhere in the world in mm. that sort of sense yeah. over the period. So we are not trying to reconsider those timelines or change the big story. Okay. Right? The, uh, the unusually thick volume is because we think that within that large story mm. lies a lot of small stories yeah, yeah. that show the gradual shifts and explain how these things happened in the particular case of India, mm -hmm. um, which might not be fundamentally the same as any other part of the world. Right, right, right. And sort of show that while the rest of the world is moving in a certain direction, and India is as well, mm -hmm. India resists it and then, you know, eventually is complicit with certain things and then mm. you know, manage to resist it further and then catches up. And, and this sort of resistance and catching up and resistance catching up creates the individual fabric right. of the country. So, so the micro-narrative, the, the micro -narrative. smaller narrative. Exactly. Or all the supposedly smaller narratives. So in that sense, it is hard to write a survey history, which is, right. you know, a large 150 right. year cycle, mm -hmm. but then also be able to sort of say that we're not just following a pre-existing script that yeah. the rest of the world is doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're continuously challenging that script and say, hey, we don't want to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, maybe we don't want to be modern. Maybe we don't want to be, right. um, you know, regionalist. Maybe we don't want to be postmodern. And that was that was true in your book, also, even in the colonial period. Like I, I, I really love, uh, uh, you know, the that that church by Arthur Shoesmith. Uh, oh yes. The, uh, the solid brick where St. Martin's Garrison in yes, Delhi. Yes, absolutely gorgeous. And, and, and uh, Shoesmith was, uh, I think, Lutyens' uh, apprentice, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And Lutyens is doing this massive, you know, strip neoclassical, uh, you know, uh, grand, grand projet. Yeah, yeah. But Shoesmith does this really weird church. Yes. Is, are these the kind of micro... Tell, tell us about that project, and oh, I, I see you have highlighted it in the book, and why? No, I, I, I find that church fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, from a personal perspective, of course, I am a resident of Delhi. I grew right. up in Delhi, and I've yeah. seen that church before, and uh, I have a personal interest in brick architecture, so that's how I first got quite interested in that church. Mm -hmm. But I think the story of that church is quite revealing of this sort of stories that get lost in the large narrative. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, uh, Shoesmith, who was helping Latians uh, during the design of Delhi, mm. actually uh, took part in a couple of competitions uh, for designing other churches in Delhi, which he lost out mm. um, to other people who ended up designing, you know, more traditional neoclassical facades. Mm. And uh, the, more, the most interesting thing about the Garrison Church is that it has this sort of very bold, almost stark modernist kind of form yeah, to it. Yeah, it's... Uh, but particularly there is a letter exchange between Latin and Shoesmith, which yes. is quite interesting, where, where Latin tells Shoesmith uh -huh. to use brick. Uh -huh. okay. But, and then um, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the yeah, exact yeah. terms, but he sort of says, um, not, not in a sort of... Uh, way where you use it as a decorative element like um, like the uh, Queen Anne style or something, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. But in this sort of bold, robust manner. And So this is a Lutyens directive? Yeah, well, Lutyens write this in yeah. the story. Well, of course, you know, it is still Shoesmith's design, yeah. but Lutyens is almost giving this permission to his apprentice to go against what Lutyens is doing, his mentor. Really? Uh, and he's telling him not to be stylistically governed almost 
like what Luckins is kind of doing with his neoclassical stuff. Because it's stuff. sort of a modernist thing to exactly. use brick this way, isn't and, it? And it is, it is fascinating that uh, Shoe Smith is able to do that, and we're so glad that that project still stands in Delhi, and then we I can mean, see it. I mean, it's sort of a precedent to Khan in Ahmedabad, is it not? Absolutely, it is. And the, Massive brick. The monumentality of it is yeah. very sort of similar in sense of talking about Khan's thing. But I think, like we were sort of saying about the larger story, I think these are the micro things which are quite important to understand that while a major story might help us think that Luckins is wholly devoted to this neoclassical endeavor, mm -hmm. right, these are the stories that help you understand that, you know, our architects don't just follow one style blindly. Right, right. That there are this constant conversations that are happening and the parallel streams coexist mm -hmm. until a time comes when the other stream takes off and becomes mainstream. So, you know, modernism will become mainstream at a later time, but in that sort of final stage of British colonial period, there is this sort of give and take where they're not quite... Complicity and contradiction. Exactly, complicity and contradiction. So, so who, who would be other sort of significant uh, uh, micro-historically important characters? I think when we're talking about the colonial period, I, I want to reinforce the thesis, which is mostly uh, out of the original work that was done by Peter Schreiber, mm. is instead of looking at those individuals like Shoesmith, which of course make for a much more interesting story, mm. it is the work that at an institutional level, things like the PWD continue mm. to do, mm. uh, which is far more interesting. And where we are, on the one hand, completely blindsided by, you know, Luckian's grand gesture and mm. this desire for um, the colonial government to have this last hurrah sort of thing and produce mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. these monumental buildings to establish its control over India, right. you know, symbolically, um, last attempt at that. At the same time, the PWD has been working for the longest period of time yeah, yeah. to create these buildings which would be clearly modernist at their heart course, in the sense course. that they... Standardized, they're, rationalized. They're, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that is more important to, instead of looking for individuals again mm. who might have sort of um, presented the opposite ideas to the sort of grand gesture. It is the consistent work of things like PWD that we are quite interested in because we are saying, well, yeah. because so, they avoid those highlights, they can stay you know, hidden and in the background and continue to do the work, which affects how the nation's uh, sort of approach to architecture and construction develops over a period of time. Um, while people like Latians come, they make a lot of big uh, splash, sort of big splash yeah. but then they disappear just as quickly yeah. as we kind of did. So how does this continue way. after independence in 1947 in the Nehruvian period? What are the sort of micro narratives and the sort of institutional yeah. Presence. So I think the PWD is an interesting case uh, and in the book we carry that thread as far forward as we can mm -hmm. mostly because even though India gets independence um, while all of this is happening a lot of the structures of governance and things continue or, or are inherited yes, from yes. the British yeah. and continue to maintain how the new new country is going to be governed even though by new sets so of people the PWD but using the is still important. so the pwd continues and then we get newer people who are heading the pwd and a very important story in that is one of habib rahman, habib rahman who course, yeah. becomes uh, uh the chief of CPWD. the cpwd yeah, yeah. and uh, his work is really interesting because he brings this particular flavor of modern architecture but not as a single name private architect mm -hmm. uh, but almost an anonymous player within right. the bracket of the PWD. Right, right. So in, he, he does uh, this sort of Gandhi Memorial in right. Calcutta, Calcutta, which has this interesting you know, combination temple. of a temple and a cross and everything, mm. which is using uh, the kind of modernist intent of simplified formal language, mm. but still responding to concerns that interestingly, even in the 90s with the Ram Janbhumi context, he brings back again. The other interesting thing to also observe is by early 70s, we also have the Architects Act. Yes, okay, the Pilo so, Modi Architects Act. Yeah. yeah, so once the Architects Act comes into position, the 
the professional uh, sort of status of the architect is affected by this as well. So mm -hmm. then the establishments of uh, the Urban Arts Commissions and a whole lot of other institutional Later, yeah, frameworks yeah, yeah. come in. So the profession goes in a slightly different direction and we can now see PWD as being one player compared to other institutional players that are affecting how the built environment is or dictating how the built environment will develop. So you so, think the Architects Act gave a significant boost to private practice in India? It's not the act. I'm just sort of saying that uh, the act is a marker to recognize that there is a discussion within uh, or about the profession, which gets some legitimacy. Right. So it's not just the act that happens. It, I'm just sort of saying that the early 70s period is also the time when a lot of the Urban Arts Commissions and stuff are established and there's an institutional understanding of what private architects and others can contribute to right. the process. So this is also the time when Korea um, becomes the chief in of SIDCO in, in, in Mumbai and right. stuff. So they are, what I'm saying is that the PWD becomes one player amongst others who are starting to Why decline. was there this shift to the more private sector? Uh, well, the assumption, of course, is the change in the political and economic structure, of course, yeah, yeah. and uh, the recognition that the country moves in a different way. But yeah. we have to recognize the 50s and 60s were a very special time. Uh, special time. You know, yeah. the people like Nehru weren't just um, leading a country in the general sense of being a prime minister, as one might be today. These were uh, deeply affected by personal networks and how you knew people and who you communicated with. So mm -hmm. all of these things were uh, deeply affected by the the circle of influence between yeah, the yeah. elite households and of stuff. Course, of course. And when we're talking about, you know, uh, the princes who still held so many parcels of land in India trying to sort of, you know, negotiate a deal with how they want to be part of the country and the whole discussion around the States of the Organization Committee in 1955 and mm. all of those sort of discussions. It's a very different time. Right, right. By the time we get into early 70s, we are finally getting to define India as a nation state in that sort of sense. And, and Indira Gandhi yeah. is, is very is a forceful and specific about that. And yes, yeah. sort of, you know, she cancels all the princely, uh, you know, private well, privies private and all that. And yeah, all that. All that. And really tries to pull together the nation uh, under her sort of socialist model. So it is a change of massive change. It's a time of massive change in India. So so you guys, so you and Peter describe the 60s to the 80s as the critical turn. Yes. And the 80s to the 90s as the cultural turn. Yes. So tell me what is the difference between the critical turn and the cultural turn? Okay, so the important thing to notice is that the chapter that says development and descent the critical turn from 60s to 80s mm. is also to be seen in relation to the one that precedes that which okay. talks about regionalism institution building and modern elite yeah. in the 50s 15th. to 70s yeah, yeah. so we sort of talk about 50s to 70s as one period and mm. then 60s to 80s as one period to show that overlap yeah yeah so in that uh, previous chapter we when we talk about regionalism and institution building and the elite we are talking about the role that was played by uh, regional elites in defining their regions versus uh, the center versus, national versus the center's uh, attempt to try and put something yeah. together as yeah. a nation, right? Mm. So if we sort of see the post-independence in the Aruvian period as a as an attempt to build this sort of nation, mm -hmm. we kind of present that other chapter as a as a resistance or a retaliation to that process mm -hmm. where the regional elites are trying to boost their own regions um, in spite of what the center might be trying so to do. So what's an example yeah. there? So, of course, that particular places where um, places like Ahmedabad become quite important mm -hmm. in that story. But we also have stories where we start looking at the establishment of things like the Birla Institute of Technology mm -hmm. and, you know. Pilani. Yeah, so all of this sort of stuff that's happening and, you know, then... And there is Chitle in, also, right? I mean, Chitle's yeah. work in Bangalore. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but Chitle, of course, uh, the is, an, uh, is, is an architect. Yeah. We we're talking about yeah. uh, characters like Birla, for instance, who as uh, regional elites are trying to boost their region. Mm. And in the process of doing that, in the process of establishing 
uh, institutions like we already know in Ahmedabad's case, Ahmedabad acquired IIM, acquired mm. NID, mm. neither of which were supposed to be based in Ahmedabad originally. Oh. It was acquired to boost right, uh, right. Gujarat, which was recently formed as a new state and had separated from the Bombay presidency. Yeah, yeah, okay. Ah, I've never connected those things. Yeah. yeah. So, so to make Gujarat yeah. uh, a state yeah, and yeah, to yeah. recognize that it is not just a leftover mm -hmm. from you from know Bombay. the division of the Bombay presidency yeah. into Maharashtra and Gujarat, which was, of course, based on uh, language mm. uh, as a division, basis of division. So they managed to acquire large national institutions like IIM and NID, mm. and then gave the commission mm. for the architecture of these to important people, which helped, you know, bolster them as the center of, you know, so cultural. So that's the regionalism identity. chapter. So, yeah. So, so what's the critical term? So what we talk about is that when there is the center trying to do something and then the region retaliating to it, there is a phase we find particularly in when we say 60s to 80s, mostly sort of uh, focused around the 70s, mm. where there is a recognition that uh, there has to be a way to bring all of this stuff together, right? So, you know, we can't have this um, separation between the center and the state mm -hmm. to continue. So we have a lot of pieces of work uh, in, in that chapter. We talk about a lot of pieces of work in the 70s where, how should I put it? Um, I mean, there's the establishment of the sort of private architectural elite class at that time. Absolutely, it is. But uh, Korea, Doshi, Raval, Jain, you know, all these people. But there's a conversation that mm. starts. So for instance, uh, in the early mid 70s the conversation that we have between the new architects who have just sort of come back and are getting into the profession mm. with the center around things like housing and stuff that yeah, become yeah. housing is a big question absolutely yeah. yeah we also start seeing at the same time uh you know projects like the dud sagar the projects like the 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 pragati medan and all of these sort of things which where the intentions that we originally saw with the elites in the regions, right, are now being combined with what the state wants to do, right? oh, sorry, the, the center wants to do, mm -hmm. to create a combination where it would sort of say, well, this is Indian mm -hmm. architecture in that sort of sense. Mm -hmm. So an example we have is uh, the, the Dutsagar Sagar project, for mm -hmm. instance, by mm -hmm. Kanvinde. Mm -hmm. And we kind of talk about how it is taking on the agenda of you know, the nationhood in one sense, but also the state in another, mm -hmm. because it recognizes art uh, from an architectural perspective what it needs to do, but it's trying to develop a national institution uh, and in this sort of cooperative format with, you know, working on the, the white revolution and all of that. So there's that sort of connection between um, the industrial aspect of what it wants to be, but then as we often talk about the Dude Sagar, uh, sorry, yeah, Dude Sagar project, as the the horns of the cow and then there is this sort of you know yeah, symbolic yeah. aspect to it as well yeah. so we start seeing projects where we have this sort of mix that is starting to develop between this sort of industrialized Nehruvian view of what india needs to be mm -hmm. and the regional desire to be expressive uh in their own sense and not lose what they might define as being part of india right um so it's sort of a Critical modernism, really. Exactly. And yeah. then we also introduce at the same time, you know, the certain things that are kind of harder to place in that uh, center region sort of conflict is um, like the Matri Mandir and Oroville and places like that, yeah. which is a very fascinating story in itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's which. Sort of outliers, sort of the micro strange story. Exactly. So, the, the capacity of something like that, which is not trying to retaliate to the center to create some sort of this regional elite response. Mm. But on the other hand, is very international and is affected by all the things that are happening right. around it. So it's, a, it's an interesting and fascinating state. So critically, we kind of present it as sort of saying, well, we can use modernist architecture and you know modernist ideas, yeah. but that doesn't need to mean that we essentially lose what it is to be here in India right. and, and respond to the local context. So then what happened in the 80s and 90s when we got the quote-unquote cultural term? So the 80s is, of course, you know, uh, a lot of the stuff in the book relates to 
political changes that are happening. And mm. it is, uh, of course, an important time for India, mostly because it follows the, the period of the late 70s and the emergency where there was a media blackout, you know, India is yeah. operating in an environment where the outside media doesn't quite know what's going on in the inside. And uh, for better or worse, there's, you know, very strong political controls on things that are happening, which create uh, retaliation within the population to what the government is trying to do. Mm. But leaving all those particular details aside, what happened is in the, well, the specifics, of course, are mean that there's a double change of government in India uh, and Indira Gandhi yeah. comes back, back in the early 80s. Yeah, yeah. But the fascinating thing about anybody who's read anything about Indira Gandhi and Congress's history will know that the Indira Gandhi that comes back in the early 80s is an entirely different, <laughs> uh, entirely different person than that of the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, with uh, people like Pupul Jekyll and stuff on our panel, mm -hmm. we start seeing this um, this version of Indira Gandhi, which is supporting almost quasi-religious kind of relationship with the Ganga and with you know the cultures and arts and things like that, right. and we start seeing as a result of that things like uh, institutions like IG and CA eventually emerge. Right? right, right, right. So that has its impact. Okay, but also. Uh, Internationally, there's a lot of stuff that has happened. So if you look at international tourism industry, for instance, in the yeah. 70s, there is a particular change yeah. where uh, we go from, uh, we go into cultural tourism, which right. starts becoming a way for countries which are not economically well off mm -hmm. to then, which are not industrially yeah. Uh, yeah, forward, yeah. right? Yeah. To have yeah. a source of income and, right. you know, and this sort of, Cultural tourism becomes another thing. Yeah. So what we think in the 80s, the most interesting thing that is happening is that India takes upon it um, this need to project a sense of well-being and solidarity to the outside world mm -hmm. after the media blackout of the 70s, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so we start seeing things like the festivals of India and stuff emerge, which right. is India proactively right, right. putting forward a sense of being India and being good and happy and being together. You know, and so the festivals of India start traveling, and we go. You know, we go to um, Sweden, we go to the Soviet Union, we go to the U.S. Yes, you know, yes, yes. And there's this overt desire to represent India through its arts and cultures as mm. this wonderful sort of uh, diverse. But you know, you, you might but, remember but, the d unity in diversity. Yes, yes. Um, but uh, tour, tour. Touristable place. Yes, but of course there is that economic concern as well because if you make that the cultural, if you commodify it, then it introduces the possibility of people to come into India. And we find within the chapter it does start happening in places like Orissa, which are quite opposite of something like Gujarat, which is highly industrialized and has been quite economically stable because of its industrialization mm -hmm. since the colonial times. But places like Orissa, which are on the Eastern Belt, right, which are not uh, industrially that sound, they start doing a lot of stuff around promoting tourism, right, right? right, and then that becomes a way for them to be part of the economic structure. But basically, this fails, right? This cultural turn, and uh, and we we end up uh, with uh, liberalization. Well, and again, you know, uh, no country is isolated yeah. and there are global things that are happening yeah. and uh, while India is going through its own sort of problems and you know we sort of see um, issues that are developing by the late 80s around uh, because of this like I, I described the cultural thing as quasi-religious mm -hmm. originally uh, kind of has a very strong religious problem that emerges and by late 80s we also have on one hand uh, things with the Mandal Commission and stratification of society and, you know, issues that are emerging from that. And on the other hand, we have uh, what eventually leads to the Babri Masjid Ram Janbhumi yeah, crisis. Yeah, yeah. 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 So those things are happening. But yeah. at the same time, the Cold War is coming to an end. The world's sort of abandoning yeah. this sort of the, you know, the two world format. Yeah. Um, so, yes, the 90s is a very, and technologically, 
there's mm. so much change happening. So yes, the 90s is a very different period where all of these things collapse. Right. But it's not just India, though. It yeah. happens globally. So right. Right. in the end, it affects India as well. Right. This is probably a good time for us to take a break. We are talking to Amit Srivastava. He's visiting here in Seattle from Adelaide, where he is a professor in architecture. Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening to Architecture Talk. This is a self-supported podcast based on an initial grant from the GAHTC. For more information about GAHTC, please visit gahtc.org. We release a new conversation every other Wednesday. So if you're enjoying this conversation, please do be sure to visit our website and to check out some of the earlier conversations. From the website, you can also subscribe to this podcast and you can listen to the other episodes. You can also simply directly subscribe to us via Spotify or via the podcast app on your iPhone. And of course, we are available to be heard via any of the other podcasting apps that are available on the internet, such as Stitcher, Overcast, etc. We would also love to hear from you if you have any questions or just some comments, or even have a suggestion for a future episode. You can reach us via the contacts page on architecturetalk.org. Thank you for listening again. And we are back and we are talking to Amit Srivastav, uh, who is visiting us from Adelaide here in Seattle. So Amit, tell us about your uh, current research. Uh, I believe you're working more on construction industry and construction history uh, with, uh, with focus on the contemporary world and its historical movings. No, I, I think, yeah, the, the word institutional is important. And uh, to a certain extent, the word everyday is important as well. So it, it is stuff that happens mm. every day, yeah. which constitutes and reconstitutes what no, the field of No, but it's different from quotidian, right? I mean, yeah. you know, you, you mean sort of how do big bodies put things together. Absolutely. It's not yeah. the architecture of everyday life as uh, no, no, Del Upton but, talks about it or others talk about but it. But the relationship between that everyday existence and how these big institutions are working because yeah. uh, more often than not we forget that the everyday is so much affected by what the larger institutions are doing mm. so to capture the processes by which those things are mediating the everyday also means understanding how that mediates the the agency of the individual architect who we might sort of regard as a genius and sort of see right, right. how they are and it's not to sort of undermine what the architect does, but to recognize that what the architect does is not in this sort of isolation where, you know, it sits and waits for a genius into, uh, sort of inspiration to come through, but um, that it's a sort of constant ability to deal with what the larger structures are doing, what the institutions are doing, and sort of responding to it. And maybe Could that's where... an example today, like where you think this is a key thing to be looking at, the relationship between the broad institutional transformations. Like, is this sort of, are you talking about availability and control of steel, for instance, which constantly goes, is an issue in the in the news? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, to a certain extent, it is about material and availability, which mm. has an economic yeah. impact on certain things. And obviously, if something is too expensive or unavailable, it will possibly not be something that the architect chooses to work with because of economic constraints. But it's not just about economic constraints, it's also about the things that we celebrate. So for instance, you start celebrating a kind of architecture or a kind of material. So let's say we uh, assume concrete becomes available and suddenly there is this phase in construction where you're doing a lot of fantastic concrete buildings and which then creates uh, as a byproduct a whole series of other structures that maybe sort of in second in secondary situations or the smaller towns or something that people start emulating this they're doing that but in addition to exporting that architectural style you also supported the the use of this material which then fuels the industry in a certain way certain other uh, materials go out of phase and you know their production becomes less lucrative so less people produce them and so on and so forth so there is economic impact that mm -hmm. is coming out of this desire to emulate certain style as well so what I'm trying to say is 
architecture is not divorced from that. Yeah, yeah, no and, question. And about we it. had to understand that not just as a constraint, but also as how generative. Yeah, how in your sort of positive support of a certain kind of material, certain type of architecture, you are constantly changing uh, the economic structure and right. you know making some people more powerful, making some people less powerful, and so on and so forth. So, yeah. so but this is still history, right? I mean, you're you're a historian. Yes, of course. Uh, and, you, and, and you were telling me earlier that you're into construction history and <laughs> that you enlightened me that there are construction history conferences. Yes, yeah. Um, I tell, think, me, tell me about construction history and construction history conferences. And oh, Okay, so let me start with why history in this context. Because when you're looking for these sort of I, sh I don't want to say subtle changes, but the changes that aren't obviously uh, available to you if you look for the highlights, as you mm -hmm. were saying, right? Mm -hmm. They only reveal themselves when you look at a longer duration. Give me so, an example. So, it, so, for instance, it's not about history as in a certain event that happened in history, mm -hmm. but history as the series of events. So, for instance, if I was to look at... Um, architectural highlights, I would say, in a particular period, a neoclassical architecture was great. And then, you know, people, it went out of favor, and then suddenly people started doing sort of Bauhaus, modernist stuff, mm -hmm. and then that went out of favor, and people started doing brutalist things. So it just seems like, you know, certain yeah. events happen, and then there's some sort of zeitgeist, which is, you know, making this happen. But um, a proper historical analysis with this would show how the transition from the use of stone as a primary material in a neoclassical setting then transfers into you know uh, other kinds of materials with steel and glass and stuff in a sort of Bauhaus modernist sense and then transfers into you know excessive use of concrete in these large brutalist structures and try to understand not just that from the perspective of the whim of the architect who's trying to capture mm. an aesthetic style but uh, responding to the transition so, of the economy. To a certain extent, that still sounds to me like a Gideon space, time, and history kind of a discussion, mm -hmm. that there are new materials, that there is new technology, so that produces a new architecture. But I think you're doing more than that, no? I mean, you're looking at so, sort so of big institutional structures and how they sort of run. So again, when you say new materials, um, where do the new materials come from? Yeah. And what makes them more popular than what existed before. So in the current context, we sort of delude ourselves that there is some sort of um, scientific rationale where certain things are better, okay. right? And so somehow if steel is better than stone or concrete is better than steel in certain situations, you end up using that. But there, it also follows some sort of sense of objectivity and truth. The more you recognize patterns of hu human interaction in history, you realize that objectivity and truth are quite malleable concepts. Right. right? And, uh, and <laughs> so no, in but a previous is it? Is, is it like people decide to privilege certain materials and techniques and then sort of proselytize them? Or is it that there is a social milieu with a certain dynamic which ends up privileging certain techniques and materials of working, which then then get sort of advocated for, which, which is it all? So you are asking if it is uh, a decision of the people? Is it, is it sort of a social process which privileges certain things? Or is it that there are CEOs of companies of certain vested interests that have a particular interest and therefore then they push it through? I think they, it is closer to the latter, oh. but maybe not quite as sinister. It's not like they're <laughs> sitting in boardrooms going, ha, ha, ha. I'm not sure. Maybe not. They are. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the thing is that they are operating in a world where certain uh, things have value. So, you know, let's say profit or um, what we kind of call this sort of myth of progress in a way. Mm -hmm. So there are certain social values that they can sell. Mm. So if they attach uh, a material object that has value for them mm -hmm. into the narrative, the social narrative around these things. So let's say, for example, 
everybody believes in progress. Yeah. Scientific progress, human progress. Now this is a humanities concept, let's say. With the well, idea modern humanities, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So historically we believe we're moving somewhere and there is progress that mm. is happening. So if I can attach, if I now want to build an industry out of steel and I can attach steel to this narrative of progress, yeah, yeah, yeah. suddenly I can use that as a basis of changing people's views around using steel, let's say even in their homes, which is something that would not have been even considered, you know, earlier. earlier. So can you, that's fascinating. That's great. So do you see these narratives working, playing out, let's say in contemporary India, South Asia, in that sphere, in the Modi India, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I, so and I, I think there. as a historian of the 20th century, huh. um, places like India, and I can't speak for India because that's the yeah, yeah. area of expertise, but I would assume it would be possible in uh, other similar places as well, are actually um, they're good case studies to mm. try and understand this because um, in the sort of post-colonial context, there are a lot of institutions that arrived in these places or thrived in these places uh, within a short period of time because of the political context. So, so you're talking about the Nehruvian period now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the idea of rapid industrialization mm -hmm. in, the, in the post um, colonial context mm -hmm. suddenly ensured that certain characters within the national sector mm -hmm had the capacity to develop larger institutions and build things and do things. So who are you talking about? What, what, what List these for me. So we were talking about construction yeah. companies, for yeah. instance. So, so Larson and Tubro. So we're talking about Larson and Tubro. Mm. We're talking about uh, Shapurji Palonji. We're sure. talking about Gan and Dunkerley. So mm. these these sort of companies that really only started with, for example, Larson and Tubro, just a couple of engineers trying to run up a small business. Yeah suddenly get this opportunity to become really big um, because of a country that's trying to rapidly develop its infrastructure. So, so why, why did l &T suddenly uh, jump into this versus others? So uh, l &T, for instance, only started as a small construction firm huh. trying to support um, sort of government projects, huh. but ended up getting a lot more uh, support in trying to do things like um, airports and roads and things like I that see. because they were able to get the right technology and material from overseas because of course both of them were European and they had all the contacts there. So that I was see. a possibility. So once that happens, you start getting massive government contracts, which ensures that very rapidly in a context like this, I you see. go from small to large scale. I see. And once you're at that scale in a in a situation like India and, you know, a third world developing context, mm. there aren't um, that many policies or, or even precedents that define what you would do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you become the basis for defining what happens within the industry at that scale or within that kind of construction. Did the Ahmedabad uh, mill owners mafia also have, play a similar role in in Nehruvian India or were they the people who lost out? <laughs> <laughs> That's hard for me too because uh, you know uh, the mills as an industrial format is not my area of uh, expertise uh, uh, so it's kind of hard to say. Uh, um, but uh, when we start looking at as we've done with the book and we look at the larger context we'll also recognize that the reason certain people are successful within the stream of construction is also because they're networked with other people who are successful within the industrial context. So there must be there must an be. opportunity. It's it's very early for me to say that, but mm. there must be an opportunity within which uh, the industrial elite mm. within the context, like the Mill Owners Association here, yeah. uh, would have provided the right networks and patronage right. uh, and support for you know some of these things to happen. We already know that within the architectural sure, case, sure, you know, sure. for instance. Uh, you know, people like the Oshi and stuff yeah. have that possibility Connection. in a place like Ahmedabad because they have the right patronage. Right. And um, yeah, so, so you're saying globalization is working? Well, globalization is working 
for some people in certain contexts. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Of course, I'm, yeah. We're only but it talking is construction. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just in terms of construction yeah. and its influence and construction companies' influence in the South Asian Indian Ocean periphery rim sphere, as you are yeah, calling it. Absolutely, yeah. So globalization is normalized, would you argue? Absolutely. The the limits the limits on national boundaries is something that you know, as a historian, is something you struggle with all the time. Mm. Because while politically and, and in sort of people's imagination, these boundaries exist more strongly mm. uh, when it comes, as we know, with stories of globalization, when it comes to trade, when it comes to understanding of technologies, of knowledge, you know, these boundaries are transgressed all the time and, you know, things sure. come in and things go out. Uh, sometimes they're easily mapped and other times they're not easily mapped. So, you know, they, these exchanges but happen all the what time. What do you see since you're based in Adelaide? Yeah. In this Australasian sort of construct. And we seem to, here in Seattle, in the US, we seem very far away. Yeah. Uh, and we don't really care about anything other than China and Japan. Yes. Uh, how would you describe the construct, contemporary construction geopolitics, design and construction geopolitics in Southeast Asia? I mean, is like Singapore a big player, China a big player, or yeah. India is the big player, or is it really just homogenized and flat? What do you? What is no, it? I think it is quite interesting. You mentioned the China thing because it's sitting in Australia, of course. China is an important yeah. uh, player um, and sometimes it's a bit frustrating working on India while sitting in Australia because <laughs> Australia is deeply concerned about what's happening in China. Um, but I think the reason we talk about the Indian Ocean Rim mm -hmm. is that we see that there is just a subtle difference in the, in the influences of these two major players you know if you look at China and India mm. there's slight difference okay. in the regions that they influence so that's why I don't use the word Southeast Asia because right. China has a certain impact mm -hmm. in its neighborhood right which is kind of if we use more uh, sort of older terminologies more sort of far east kind right, of story right, right, right. and then there's this sort of Southeast Asia which is an extension of China's yeah. influence and then Australia is very much connected to that sort of yeah. more of the Pacific Pacific rim yeah, story. There's the, right. so the Pacific Rim story, yeah. and then there's an Indian Ocean story. The Indian Ocean Rim story, I think, is... We've struggled very hard to sort of, you know, come up with how do we talk like about term, the areas right. of yeah, yeah. influence. And we say Indian Ocean Rim because India has a much stronger uh, sort of connection with the Middle East, particularly in this sort of construction story. I so see. when you start talking about places like Dubai and stuff, yeah, you know, yeah. the, the presence of both... Indian, and I want to say Indian, but it also includes like you know, Bangladeshi, yeah, Pakistani, Asian. and South Asian uh, labor and technologies and companies mm -hmm. uh, much much stronger. So so this so there's more of that sort of Western link, but also on the Southeast Asian side, uh, on on the Western front mm -hmm. towards the Indian Ocean, there's more links here. But if so you go Indian further, Western it's, side, so we say it was some Burma. Uh, Myanmar, yeah, uh, of course, but also uh, Malaysia, Malaysia and, and uh, a little bit Singapore, Singapore in that sort of sense. Indonesia a little yeah. bit. But uh, the, the further you go away into sort of, you know, the Philippine side or Macau or all those sort of things, of course, that is China. the, the, the Chinese influence. And of course, Australia continuously sees its relationship with that, with trading partners in places like Korea and Japan and China. Uh, that, of course, affects the Australian economy the most. So... Sitting in Australia is not particularly useful in that sense to understand the India story, but it gives us this interesting distance. And of course, we travel to India quite often as well. So it is an ability to get away from India to be able to look at the larger geopolitics of that. But yeah, I, I think that's what I would sort of say, that there is this very subtle difference yes. in the area of influence. I mean, there's a sort of a competition over Africa now. Oh, yeah, that? I was just about to mention <laughs> Africa. Uh, uh, tell and us that's, about... that's where we are starting to get a bit more interest in time, because China has sort of growing interests, uh, in and has had actually been uh, uh, a lot of influence in Africa, some documented, some not so well documented. Um, 
but of course India has old ties mm -hmm. with Africa mostly because of migration and, and stuff which meant that there's a lot of Indian population mm -hmm. in eastern parts of Africa that exist from mm -hmm. colonial times yeah, yeah. and they have these um, these bases of Indians in Africa have maintained trade connections as well so right. when we're talking about places like Gujarat they have continuous strong, connections strong, 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 strong connections so those places in Africa still have a very close tie to India and and we find that when we talk about the Indian Ocean Rim we are able to talk about certain parts of Eastern Coast Africa in that sort of sense and that's why it becomes an easier way for us to approach Africa as well rather than saying Africa is such because China of course you know has influence there mm -hmm. so India's influence I would sort of say has had that sort of Middle East and Eastern Africa connection in that sense a lot more okay so that's interesting sort of it's funny very interesting for me that uh, in the view from Australia yeah there is kind of like a split line up the peninsula Southeast East Asian Peninsula. Yeah. There's the sort of China zone. Yeah. And then there is the India zone. Yeah. It, which kind of seems to m continue to mirror ancient, ancient meaning th millennial old, yeah. 1000 year old uh, zones of influence. Absolutely. And, and I think we might have redressed versions of, you know, let's say make in India and this and that that yeah. happens and uh, every, uh, Every political party has its own rhetoric that they want to put up forward. But any kind of reality that backs it has a longer term historical reference to it. So nothing is created overnight. You know, these relationships only develop, of course, over decades and decades of connections between people and existing partnerships and trades and things that make people right. comfortable to share ideas. And... Uh, Cool. So how would you what, describe us your sort of project now? I mean, we are in, getting into construction, institutional history. How would you describe this project that you and, you and Peter are sort of embarking into? Well, um, I think in method and process, it's not radically different to what you do with writing about architectural history. So you start with players mm -hmm. start with um, you know, I say players in this sense because uh, when speaking about architects you can often say individuals right. but, you know here we're talking about institutions so you start with a few institutions or players and you start looking at their particular history mm -hmm. and um, as you start doing that it helps you understand the networks and identify mm -hmm. sort of other players that are affecting those changes mm -hmm. And thereby end up creating a, a much more broader network mm. and write a history which then covers larger geographical areas and possibly the entire national boundary. So at this moment, I wouldn't sort of say that we'll be able to obviously say everything about the construction industry in all of India. Mm -hmm. Already mm -hmm. trying to write that in terms of architecture is almost impossible. Right, right. Um, but so, of course, we'll start with some of those big, big players, players that yeah. we've talked about and try to understand both their historical development but also their historical influence to see how those things might have affected not just the regions that they operate in but have been might have been emulated or you know uh, have mm -hmm. affected farther reaches of the country well Amit thank you for co coming to architecture talk yeah, you're welcome thank you very much for having me Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash, your host, and our producer is the one and only Sammy Prouty, a graduate student of architecture here at the University of Washington in Seattle. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation, and if you did, please do take a moment to subscribe and to rate us on iTunes. See you next time. Take care. Goodbye.